This week, Robert Martin, the Senior Principal Software and Supply Chain Assurance Engineer at MITRE Corporation, joins us to discuss software supply chain security and MITRE system of trust. In the security news, the Roblox prison yard, password manager problems, PyTorch gets torched with a supply chain attack, Oppenheimer is cleared, Puck Kung Fu, spice up your persistence with PHP, turning Google Home into a wiretap device, Nintendo 3DS remote code execution, Linux kernel remote code execution, uh, stealing cars in 2022, the API way, and there's no software supply chain. All that and more on this episode of Paul Security Weekly. This is Security Weekly, for security professionals, by security professionals. Broadcasting live from G-Unit Studios in Rhode Island, it's the show where exploits run wild, packets aren't the only things getting sniffed, and the cocktails flow steady, it's Paul's Security Weekly. PlexTrack is the premier pen test reporting and collaboration platform, empowering your team to spend more time hacking and less time reporting. PlexTrack centralizes your data, streamlines tedious workflows, automates report building, and facilitates communication with stakeholders. To learn how you can achieve a 30% increase in efficiency and cut report cycles by up to 65%, head to securityweekly.com forward slash PlexTrack. Claim your free month of PlexTrack and get your copy of the Writing a Killer Penetration Test Report Guide today. And welcome to the show. But first, let me introduce you to a man who's addicted to brake fluid, despite saying he can stop whenever he wants, Mr. Paul Asadorian. Welcome everyone to Paul Security Weekly. It is episode number 768 being recorded on January 4th, 2023. Of course, your host, Paul Asadorian. Mr. Larry Pache is to my left. Welcome, Larry. Hey, it's good to be here. It's good to have you. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Thanks. First show of the new year. Yeah, we're going to do predictions today, right? (laughs) Oh, my God. (laughs) I can't. I can't with the predictions. <laughs> I'm kidding. And we're going to recap the best of 2022 as well. Oh, nice. Right? Nice. What, uh, yep. Uh, okay, so do. we can do that right now. Yep, it was it was 2022, and I predict we're not going to have any predictions. There you go. It's a good prediction. Mr. Josh Marpet is here with us. Josh, welcome. Hey, how you doing, man? I'm doing good. Happy New Year, man. Oh, Happy New Year. It's uh, Honestly, I almost forgot the show was tonight. I, ca- I swear to God, I thought it was Tuesday. Yes. Yes. It's the second that. day working this week. Yes, I've been yes. doing that all week as well. Mr. Tyler Robinson is here with us. Tyler, welcome. What's up? Happy 2023, everybody. Going to be a good year. That's right. Mr. Jeff Mann is here with us. Jeff, welcome. Good to see everyone. Happy New Year. I made the first episode in 2023. I'm on a roll. (laughs) Yay. It's made every episode this year. That's right. (laughs) That's right. Uh, Per contract. uh, Lee's not with us right now. Is that? We don't have Lee tonight. Oh, Lee's only segment two. And Mandy didn't make. Okay. Making sure I didn't miss anyone. Uh, you can find us now on Instagram. Follow us for highlight reels, giveaway announcements, and more uh, by following at Sec Weekly. Robert Martin is a senior principal software and supply chain assurance engineer at the MITRE Corporation and has dedicated his career to solving some of the world's most difficult problems in systems and software engineering. Robert joins us to explore software supply chain security, one of my favorite topics. Bob, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. It's nice to have you, my friend. Uh, Thanks for joining us. I wanted to uh, start off by asking you how you got your start in information security. Actually, um, I had two engagements. I started out in the back in the 80s when we were working uh, this little program for DOD. But uh, then I got into more systems engineering for a while. But then the uh, Y2K uh, Mm. episode, I ended up running that for MITRE and many of our customers around the world. And at the end of it, all these people started worrying about uh, people trying to attack systems, pretending to be Y2K bugs. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And so I ended up uh, back into uh, cybersecurity. Bob, did I see this right? Have you worked for MITRE for over 40 years? Uh, Yep. What's, uh, what's what's kept you there? What's, 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 what's special about Miner that's kept you there for forty years? It's awesome. Um, always interesting things, challenging things, 
Um, you know, we're working on some of the most uh, challenging problems anyone has, and we get to work with great people out in industry and different parts of the world, different parts of the government. What's not to like? Mm. Well, hey, God, real well, quick, go Paul. Ahead. Yes. Uh, yeah. Just because he's sort of a, a, a peer. Mm. Um, uh, you didn't mention the program that you worked with in the 80s. Are you allowed to? Uh, yeah, that was called uh, WIMIX, uh, okay. Upgrade of the Worldwide Military Command and Control System. Gotcha. I was uh, uh, DOD affiliated starting in 86, well, actually in 84. So I was just curious. Uh, yep. And do you still program in COBOL? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> nope. <laughs> I can read it. Okay. Back to you, Paul. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, Bob, I was going to ask what. Um... What got you on software supply chain security? Now we we joke we have a joke on the show. Let me preface this with um, that we always reference the paper by Ken Thompson. Is it Ken Thompson that wrote what is the seminal paper on software supply chain issues? Yeah, we reference that a lot. Okay. <laughs> so what got you started well, on it? Well, I mean the challenge with software these days is it's got a built-in supply chain, right? Nobody starts with their own, you know, space and just builds all of it. They're going to leverage other people's. So that's a totally different challenge than most managers that are in, you know, positions of authority ever experienced. And so guess what? It's something they don't know how to deal with. Um, not that the rest of us know how to deal with it either. It's a, it's a challenge because we are trying to, you know, leverage other people's work who may not even be aware we're using it and where we're using it and how we're using it. And yet we go screaming at them for fixing bugs or not fixing bugs. And they're just saying, hey, I just wrote this stuff. I, you know, you don't have to use it. So it's a, it's a challenge. Yeah, for in specifically in open source, right? Like a, a lot yeah. of us were just like, yeah, well, I, I wrote this thing and put it out there. Like there's no warranty. There's no. Yeah, uh, yeah. I'm not your supplier. You, you just picked up a rock that you found and decided to put it in your wall. No, that's a great analogy, though. And because I think many, especially corporations, think of it as their supplier. Like open source is my supplier. So we should be able to ask them to do things although many think of it as telling them to do things it's like but well, you're why how <laughs> yeah. is that possible yeah i mean it, giving feedback about you know my rock is not as smooth as it could be you know maybe i'll polish it but uh you know it's it's the rock i made how, how big is the so specifically on open source uh software supply chain how big is this problem how prevalent is open source software in all of everyone else's supply chain? Yeah, I, I, there's different studies that have been done, and it's way up there past two thirds, if not higher, of every um, piece of software is made of these other pieces of software. I mean, think about the way that people develop software now with, you know, frameworks and, you know, widgets and gadgets and, you know, calling services and capabilities, you know, you, you you don't really write a lot yourself in many cases. Now, if you're in, you know, uh, an embedded system or doing something tailored to some environment, yeah, you may really have to sit down and, you know, figure out how to write real code. But for a lot of people, it's just assembling stuff. Mm. Yeah, I tend to, uh, I, so I want to get your take on this, Bob. I break out, when people say I, supply chain issues or supply chain security, it tends to be an overloaded term. I broke it down in my mind into three buckets. There's your physical supply chain. So like the Red Cross needs to make sure it preserves its supply chain for bandages and things like that. In computers, that's, I got to know what the supply chain is for the devices that I have so I could replace them potentially. Then there's the, I dubbed this one third-party software. I haven't written the software myself, but I have this software and it has a supply chain. And then there's the software that I write myself and I have to preserve its supply chain with libraries and potentially open source. Well, software. and there's also the supply chain of 
the physical, the software supply chain of those physical things you get. They have mm -hmm. firmware in there. Mm -hmm. They have you know, OSs and a lot of you know pre-installed software that you expect to be updated and you know patched and managed. And so <laughs> that's big, a big different managed, big, managed. big ah. expectation, Bob. I, I think of firmware. I know. I think of firmware. I put the bar way up there. Yeah. I think of firmware as software that's inconvenient to program, <laughs> but the way you described it was was interesting, and I don't remember exactly the the phrase that you used, but it was the 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 hardware comes with this software that yeah. that like I can't I don't I can't change. I'm not installing it. It's beyond the operating system, right? I'm not I'm not installing it. Yeah. It just it comes along for the ride. Yeah, well, it enables it, right? You know, yeah. device drivers and like I said, the firmware. All the BIOS and you know, it's there to make that piece of metal and silicon and plastic do something. Mm. Um, now you want to do it something tailored, so you're going to add in more software and different kinds. You know, for instance, your you know studio uh, enabled software on your laptop that you're using for the show. That's not the way it came out of the box, right? Yeah, I you're right. I feel like there is software that is customizable by the user whereas the firmware level not a whole lot of customization being done there. A lot less. Right. But in a supply chain point of view, you want to know that that came from the right place, that the appropriate people validated it, tested it. Um you may depending on what you're going to do with your computer, want to know that you know, somebody didn't uh, do a solar winds on it and, mm -hmm. you know, send you something that wasn't meant to be there. Right. Is solar winds now a verb? <laughs> I <laughs> use it. I, well, it that way? I use, I do use, I like, you know, your solar winds or your log for Jade. <laughs> like, those are the distinctions. Log for Jade software, yeah. I write. Two different flavors. Yeah. But for me, the, the other, de, um, delineation I draw is between a vulnerability and a backdoor in the supply chain. Oh, right? yeah. Because those are... You know, mal so one's a quality issue mm -hmm. and one's malicious taint. Right. You know, so one, you should have a program, you know, that addresses quality and secure and safe and resilience code can be a quality issue depending on your criteria. You know, if it's in your car... Um, those issues that would be in a laptop would be a vulnerability. Well, they're a safety issue. Mm. Um, so, you, you know, people have to be a little broader than our traditional security flaws. We need to think about the different uses these uh, software-enabled things are performing and what's the consequences of these, you know, uh, mistakes, which... Yeah, they can be triggered by an attacker, but they can also be just triggered by input and, you know, mistakes. So, sorry, my wrist rang. Yeah, no, it's okay. <laughs> One of the things that, <clears throat> that I find interesting, and I started thinking about this when I wrote the, a blog post that takes supply chain security examples from the Star Wars canon and, and, and relates them to what we experience in our field in technology. And the um, flaw that Galen Urso purposely introduced that ultimately led to the thermal exhaust port being, you know, the right. culmination of that flaw was per what we found out as we got more movies and content is that that was purposely introduced. And what I find it, what I can't find good examples of, like, have there been cases in the past where a vulnerability was introduced on purpose to create a supply chain security issue? I don't know about a supply chain issue, but I know that at one point there was discussion about, you know, MITRE had created the common weakness enumeration. We were doing CVEs and, you know, those were the things that you could accidentally do or, um, you know, that we needed to have a better way of finding and removing and making sure people didn't do. There was a discussion about putting the catalog together of how would people hide some 
capability um, so that they could trigger. Mm -hmm. uh, not not a backdoor, but rather uh, what it turned out to be was they were talking about the CWEs. Mm -hmm. You know, the, those are the building blocks that they could purpose build a, a exploitable vulnerability that, oh, sorry, I made the same mistake everybody else on the development team made. Right, right. Because it, I also find that even weaknesses, certainly software vulnerabilities, like a traditional buffer overflow, can go undetected for 20 years oh. sometimes, right? Oh, yeah. Or longer. And well, I mean, you can't test every path. Right. And especially when you get into millions and millions of lines of code. Uh, a weakness is interesting. I still think that that's probably more difficult to detect than, than a backdoor. Backdoors tend to be easier to in my i don't know in my mind yeah no they're, they're is, right? much more straightforward mm. there's certain criteria about you know how you can invoke them that makes them you know kind of reachable in many cases and they have to you know kind of stay hidden you know you can't it can't be the actual wall has a flaw because that would be a pretty complicated flaw, right? Mm -hmm. It would be obvious that it's not part of the wall. Right. Whereas it, for overflow, it can be just a normal part of the logic that just isn't going to behave the way you thought it would. Mm -hmm. do, you, do you think we're fighting a losing battle here? And is, is there, are we at a precipice where we have to come up with that golden moment of doing things differently? Obviously, there's some languages that introduce some more secure um, you know, memory securities and, and a little bit more secure coding practices. But if we look at all the way from OS vulnerabilities to open source libraries being introduced into those, you know, we're trying to fight this with S bombs and, and really understand them all. But we look at the million pieces of code that run not just on the operating systems or the binaries behind those operating systems or the libraries that run on the binaries behind those. But now we have SaaS applications and browsers that mm -hmm. are introducing. Uh, you know, serverless and code stacks that we have no control over. So is all of this a losing battle? And do you think that there is a point like you've been around in this industry for a very long time? Do you see a tipping point where we have to have kind of a more creative and aha moment where we look at software differently and begin to address these issues in a different manner? Well, I think the one thing that we could do that, you know, we'll get hues and cries about is uh, get rid of all the EULAs. <laughs> you know, make software something that has to be reliable just because that's the way in the air for the product. You know, if you had the same kinds of fundamental flaws in, you know, any other kind of product, you know, everybody would be out of work because nobody would accept it. I think it's interesting, Bob, in the sense that so like I, I work for a firmware security company and sometimes when I describe what we do, they're like, shouldn't that come from the manufacturer already secure? <laughs> and <laughs> I think, think going back to the top of this interview, right? When we get open source software or any other software, we kind of have this like, like, isn't it the supplier, whoever that is job to make sure that it's secure before they, they give it to me. But I think if that were the case, like we all wouldn't have yeah, jobs. There's no, now, right? Yeah, there's no norms of due diligence. There's no... You know, anybody can write software. They don't have to have any training, any professional license. They don't have to be skilled or shown to be able to do anything. They don't have to validate what they do against any norms. And and so guess let what? Me, we have what we have. Let me, let me ask a shift on that question, Paul. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> Uh, because you've been around as long as I have, probably a little bit longer, which is uh, humbling. Um, you know, back. <laughs> I think it's the first time I've ever heard Jeff say that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have to pay homage. He's he's been working this thing all uh, at the same place as long as I've been in the industry. That's crazy. At any rate, um, back in the beginning of you know whatever we call this internet craze fad thing. <clears throat> Uh, even before that, you know, just, you know, personal computers and getting, getting desktops and IBM PCs out, it, it was always, you know, which made us have jobs, uh, but everything was designed to be plug and play and everything was turned on. And, you know, that's why we have, 
uh, hardening standards and guides mm-hmm. for how to turn things off. And, you know, that has shifted over the years. But uh, I have to think that the argument, uh, and to try to put this in the form of a question, has the argument changed on, you know, now, but now it's more software than, you know, in the old days it was hardware of, well, you know, well, it works. You know, we we want to give you the pieces and the parts and 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 have it be able to work for you. Um, I, I feel like there's some sort of argument for, you know, it depends, you know, on the implementation, and you don't know what you're getting into when you know, yeah. you know, when you're distributing something. Uh, any any thoughts along those lines? Well, I mean, the the paradigm we seem to follow is that software needs to have some core functionality that's very configurable. You can change it all over the place and make it, you know, into something specific for your environment or your challenge. And so that means that the development team, even if they wanted to test every option in every configuration has a losing proposition, they can't, they can't, Um, you know, so I do think we're kind of stuck in that, you know, nobody wants to write software that only does one very, very, very specific thing. Um, so what I'm want hearing you say, it, it's kind of by design. I mean, and yeah. like you said, we're, we're kind of stuck with this. So we right. can we can we can lament about it, but we're not we're not going to fix it. So what do we do instead of? Yeah. How it? do we incentivize people to be a little better, be a little safer? Um, Because I know most of them don't want to be, you know, have their product, you know, be the cause of something bad. You know, that's, you know, people who create things are proud of it, usually. And so they want it to be really good at what they think they're making it do. Now, we may go make it do something different, (laughs) use it, but... You know, at least they've got that pride, that that um, ownership you know, idea. Even so, if I'm open source and I just produced a rock, it's my rock. It's this shape that's my rock. You know, the fact that you can do something else with it is great. You know, but it means that I may not have tested or built it to do everything you think it should do. Bob, does that rock come with a list of all the minerals that comp- comprise that rock? <laughs> well, it would if my x-ray machine in the uh, right. chemistry lab in the back basement was working, but I had uh, it, them off the clock during the holidays. Larry, you can slap him now. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, That would imply that I haven't already. <laughs> that's, always my, that's always my question. One thing about S-bombs, my first question is, if I don't trust, inherently don't trust the supplier of a component, how can I trust the list of what comprises <laughs> the components of that component that come from that supplier? It's a great point. Right. So, yeah, you I think Chris um, Blask, he actually has a company that, that is decompiling <laughs> software and comparing it to the S-bombs. A Cybeats, is correct. it? Is it Cybeats, yeah. Bob? Yeah. Yeah, that, that so like- there's going to be, I think, a trend towards having the automation create the SBOM. So it's an integral part of the build and it gets signed at the same time as the executable gets signed Mm -hmm. by the same key within microseconds. You know, so you're going to start to have evidence about that can be used to figure out, oh, maybe I do trust this. It's, you know, on the same machine from the same source, in the same, you know, very small time frame um, with the same key. Okay, that source has this S bomb. And, you know, then you can maybe go to, well, and what was the build configuration? And, you know, you can start to build out from the basic ingredients into how was it made? Who made it? Where did the piece parts come from? Not everyone needs that information, but some people do. Well, I think I think most of us need that information because it answers the question of, do I have this software component, right? Now, all of a sudden, OpenSSL is vulnerable. And do I have it? And can it be, is that, what, do you see that as one of the use cases for S-bombs is a, oh, yeah. a retroactive investigation 
uh, support. Well, and, and, and yeah, for either vulnerabilities or just, you know, if something goes wrong and you're trying to figure out, you know, why one part of it is, well, what's in the thing and mm -hmm. where did it come from? Was it tested? Was it, you know, you know, what were the build options that were used that, you know, let it run out of threads or something, you know, something that from a design point of view, you would expect it not to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, is this like a, it's really interesting where this, sit, does this sit in vulnerability management or asset management or some integration between the two? Yeah, no, I think that's one of the things that the story on SBOMs needs to grow out to mm -hmm. is an SBOM is not just for vulnerability management. You know, some people will use it for that, but it also can be used to manage your assets. You know, I know some people in the medical industry are going to use it to look at the components and see what's the health of the developer community around them. Mm -hmm. You know, is it actively being maintained or should I maybe find a different component because that one's end of life and I need to swap it out so that I have a viable support infrastructure around the product. You know, then there's, you know, contract clauses. You can use it to, you know, nail down an agreement. What are you getting from when and who? And, you know, there's there's a lot of different ways you could use it. You could use it for your enterprise network defense. Very fine green details about what's on every box. And, you know, when a new attack comes in and you figure out what's susceptible to it, you can very quickly figure out, well, what's the operational impact? Because I now know, you know, what's on every box and hopefully I know what functions are being done on which box. You can figure out is payroll at uh, risk or just the, the you know, air handler down the hall, which is critical, but not as critical as, you know, something that can bleed money. Yeah, I you like know, the... it's interesting. Go ahead, Josh. We talk, I apologize, but I had to say this. We, we talk right. about asset inventories and information inventories and, and all of these inventories being kind of the uh, the cornerstone or the, the foundation of security. And the first, you know, it's one of the fundamentals. You have to get an asset inventory. You have to get an information inventory, data flow diagrams, things like that. And yet what an SBOM is, is effectively another layer of an asset inventory in your software inventory. Right. Yep. It's taking that thing that came in as a hunk and saying, well, oh, Actually, there's a whole bunch of things inside that hunk, and they can be dangerous to you. Maybe you ought to understand them. I think that's really interesting is to use it to determine what could be more damaging than something else, right? Compare yeah. similar devices, go like, I've got this class of systems, and I've looked at all the S-bombs, and this kind of, these few are doing something a little different. Like maybe they've got an older library, maybe they're more susceptible. Yep. So that's something maybe I should pay attention or maybe it's the really newer one. And I'm like, well, maybe that's a stability issue, right? I think it, it gives us an opportunity. If we start analyzing the data from SBOMs in an intelligent way like that, we can almost use it as a proactive measure. Do you, do you agree, Bob? Yeah, no, I think we'll find in some um, domains and some types of devices and some types of, you know, like medical or health or, um, you know, transportation or different areas may find that that additional data really helps them fine tune their assessment of risk, especially where there's systems that you can't just, oh, sorry, we're applying patches now. Um you really got to schedule it and, and make sure you have, you know, redundant systems. It'd be really good to know which ones are really, really important versus the ones that, yeah, you need to do it soon. Mm. Um, when we get to open source software, one of the things that got me thinking more about the software supply chain is I use Linux on my desktop. So at first, I'm required to tell you that by the unspoken contract we have as Linux users, <laughs> I use Linux on my desktop. But the amount of software from the various places that I get it from that cross, I mean, when I update, I run Manjaro Linux, I just did an update in this laptop to my left, and it pulled down 30 packages from like God knows where, from God knows who, and I just had to trust that. 
how do how do we build something that makes me feel better and be ultimately be more secure in in this process especially when we talk about linux and open source specifically right i mean the whole idea of the orchestration of updates and how things are applied and what whose keys signed which things oh there's an idea signing your software mm -hmm. so that we actually know it's the software you intended to send us right. um there's a lot of things we need to grow up about uh, in that area and uh one of the interesting things is a new effort uh out of the ietf the internet engineering task force um there's a new working group on supply chain integrity, transparency, and trust, SCIT. And um, for one, it was chartered in a very, very short time compared to most uh, IETF working groups. But <laughs> it's really trying to get at that. How do I know how the software was built, um, tested, who, who was involved in it? Lots of gory details that you are not going to share with most people, mm -hmm. but you need to record it and have it available. So someone like maybe a cu customer that wants it or by contract, you have to give it or because some um, investigation or, or your auditor or somebody, you know, how do you do that in a way that it doesn't matter who you're, you are, you can do it in a standard way. So that's what the, the ITF skit standards are trying to do is make these services capabilities that we can have and use and you know i can build my product i can keep all the details about how i built it how it was tested how it was validated what you know criteria did it follow and then later somebody can say well i'm gonna buy your product but i need to understand that what was the engineering and, and due diligence behind it? You can now bring the, you know, let them query your skit ledger for that without, you know, giving it to them. They, you're just giving them query access. Once they're satisfied, you can cut it off because that's intellectual property. Mm -hmm. And we don't want that just, you know, bouncing around. And that could also be the way you share S bombs. <clears throat> You know, for a lot of proprietary software, they may not want to have it out on a website or in a repository that anyone can get to with the right credentials. But maybe, you know, giving access to a skit ledger to get that, maybe that works. I guess the what you made me realize is that on Linux, it's not necessarily that I distrust the person who created the software. I more distrust the person who's packaging that software for that Linux yep. distribution. How it was put together and yeah. how it was. That's yep. a huge problem. And it's one of the reasons I left Ubuntu because to get the latest version of this, well, it's not in, you know, Canonical has their repositories and that software is typically out of date. I can get the latest one. And is that a snap? Is that a flat pack? Is that an app image? <laughs> or do I have to compile from source? And, I, and then it, oh, it depends. So you end up doing all of it, right? <laughs> to and then get how the software that then, you want. Then how do you update them? You got to remember you go. how you installed them. Exactly. So I, that's yeah. why I switched to Archbase. And do you, do you trust the installer? <laughs> and that's, what, that's where my distrust lies largely is when I started unpacking the packaged um, utilities, I was like, anyone in a flat pack, anyone could put a command in there that executed anything they wanted to. And so right. basically I would have to look at every single, you know, build package and make sure they weren't doing anything malicious. Right. So S bombs aren't going to address that, right. but I think the, you know, type of uh, other information that you could gather and surround an S bomb with could address that. And I think communities that um, see the need from their members to have that kind of integrity data, that fidelity of, Providence and pedigree, they'll they'll have mechanisms to respond to it. Because mm. the other thing is you interesting, know, in, and that's go ahead. Uh, jo, was that Josh? Okay. Sorry. Yeah, it was. I, I mean, the other the, the, like this actually applies to everything. You know, you're talking about Linux packages, right, and package managers, and so on and so forth. And you're like canonical has outdated ones, but then you've got the individual ones and who the hell could have built them. 
But then, you know, do you trust Microsoft for your Windows updates? Do you trust, uh, uh, you know, Apple for your Mac updates? By the way, let's talk about the app stores on Apple, you know, iOS and Android. And uh, let's be honest, that's an entire supply chain issue right there. Mm. The, the, this, this is not just a Linux problem. This is a, this is a literally multiverse, you know, the supply chain multiverse is real. Well, and the fact is that even though you just gave some swim lanes there, um, software usually passes across swim lanes. You know, it's it's not just one, you know, brand or one vendor family. It usually, you know, it gets used across. And it's the same with normal products, right? You know, it's the same switch in all the dryers, doesn't matter whose dryer you buy. Mm -hmm. So, you know, how do that, how does the manufacturer of that dryer uh, switch give assurance to all these different vendors? It can't follow each of their quality approaches. It needs to be able to offer insight into what it did when they go ants, you know, is this done right? Is it going to cause a fire danger when I put it in my dryers? The solutions you know, to this problem only work if you secure all the links in the chain. Oh, but the, wait, wait, or at least now, have a now, reason now. to understand the links and mm -hmm. what was done in them. Mm. What if I put a dryer underwater? I mean, this is stupid. Bear with me. What if I put a dryer in a in a in a in a thousand degree furnace. What like there are also multiple conditions under which that switch right. might be required to be used. Uh, uh, ca Caterpillar engines, for example, I don't know how I know this, but I do. Uh, you can actually buy the exact same engine rated for different horsepower ratings, but it depends on the duty cycle. If you want a 100% duty cycle engine, it's gonna be rated much, much lower than if you want the same right. engine for a 10% duty cycle. So the different conditions define right. Okay, right. so is it gonna In work? context right. is king. Context, yeah, context is at least perhaps key. And so now yeah. you've got S bombs that say this software will do this. Okay, great. Under what conditions? Right. And that's, I think, where you get to the claims that somebody can make about software. And that's another thing that we think the skit ledger could be the holder of. So people make claims. Well, what evidence do you have to back up that claim? And can you make it available for inspection or review, either when I'm looking around to buy software or when I'm going to go buy some product? You know, the idea of a skit ledger really is not addressing anything unique to software. It's just the one with the burning hot real need for it. A lot of the other industries have come up with paper-based approaches that they're now suffering from but it still kind of works for them but as they get more software in them as they scale across the world the paper isn't keeping up and that's all this is all only taking into the account from a supply chain standpoint especially for software the vulnerability or <clears throat> i'll say insecure coding uh, or vulnerability from that, we haven't even addressed the fact of the company's, you know, data privacy, the data they hold, or poor design decisions, and and how they've implemented certain aspects of the product in which we're using. All of which would fall underneath of something that soft the software S bomb uh, may not be able to cover. Yeah, we like, we'll, like we'll did, be able to do they protect identify. their do they protect their keys and or certificates. Right. Keys or certificates, what's the master data, like what's their development process and the data that leads to intelligence or additional insight that an attacker can use or leverage from a supply chain just to get access. You know, you talk about a business email compromise and injecting into vendor uh, emails and looking at that or stealing all the keys in order to push something or a product to another company. Like all of those are outside of the vulnerability side of this. So we have a really big problem from a software standpoint and really addressing software and identifying it as the risk that it is software in and of itself has not been uh, not been correctly identified from a business risk standpoint in my opinion outside of typical cve vulnerabilities there's a lot of other ways that misconfiguration and or uh, just company in general use and and security practice uh, is not covering well, and that actually opens the door to uh, another of my favorite things these days 
which is MITRE's supply chain effort in, called System of Trust, where we actually do address those kinds of things. It's basically, think of it as all of the risks from your supply chain, either the supplier, the supply it itself, or service offerings that you may need to consider. So the idea is give everybody the same starting point now, for any particular project, any particular activity, you're going to probably pull down to a very small subset of that. But when you go talk to somebody, you can say, I'm looking at these uh, risks out of system of trust, and they'll understand because it's defined, it's available. It's, um, you know, I talked to Josh about this uh, almost a year ago, and, you know, we've moved it quite a ways further along. Um, sot.mitre.org if you want to go learn more about it. But trying to address those issues about how does the company build the product? How do they manage the product? What about their networks that they're building the products on, over? Are they manage those? Are they vulnerable? You know, they're just a nice open pathway to you because people can get in and do whatever they want to the product they're building. Yeah, I, I get concerned especially working in firmware security with, well, that hardware will only run software that's been signed by that key. I'm like, but what, what happens if they lose that key? <laughs> <laughs> then, then, it's, then it's game over, right? Then we've seen, we've had some closed brushes last year, uh, you know, with that. Unfortunately, in the circumstance I'm thinking of, it was like a developer key so that it was never deployed on systems. But had it been, it means yep. you could bypass a lot of those controls that like make sure the firmware you're running on your PCs, laptops, and servers is actually coming from the manufacturer and not from an well, there's, there's There's some very critical links in most people's, you know, trustable architectures, mm. you know, and often encryption is part of that critical underpinning that gives you a reason to have trust. Mm-hmm. I mean, zero trust is going to fix all this, though, right? <laughs> no, okay, I got a bridge. <laughs> Tyler, is there anybody nearby that I can ask to slap you? Uh, <laughs> there should be. I'll do one for myself. <laughs> but it's it's interesting when we, we think about you know drivers as well. That's one that uh, is is pretty fascinating, right? You think about how many drivers are signed by Mike, ultimately by Microsoft, and are are trusted well, before but, they didn't used to be right <laughs> it was, was even it was more the, the wild, wild west. west yep but that's certainly but, yeah. i because I, I almost look at that as a uh and i think we've identified it as a different supply chain aspect right because it's not necessarily a vulnerability it's not necessarily a backdoor it's someone has mishandled a process that provides the integrity through the use of encryption with a key or certificate right. or signature or hash or whatever it is. I, th I think of that as different. I don't know that your remediation is much different because it's ultimately very similar to applying a patch. You're well, and it's a something you have to manage or try right. to understand and appreciate. And, and that's the thing about supply chain, whether it's software or others, it's, it's, there's a lot of nuances and getting um, the right set of them in front of your team so you can manage it is a big challenge and most people step up to oh i gotta manage my software supply chain and they start writing down things that they should care about and a blank sheet of paper really scares me because mm -hmm. most people aren't creative enough um so and of course who's going to understand the way they wrote it up right right yeah it's it's it's, it's interesting to think about how it how it affects the key certificates and things like that uh for sure because i mean ultimately we're just at the mercy of that chain of trust How, and it, can we do a better job with the action the revocation list aspect of it bob in oh, your experience yeah. i feel like there's so many cases where it, that pro the process falls down when they go all right someone needs to like update or re like revoke a key uh but then i have to take that and i have to update my own revocation like so many different people in the supply chain have yeah. to take an action in order for that revocation to take place. Yeah, I don't know if there's a better way to do 
signing key management and all of that. Um, but I'm hoping there's people looking at that seriously because, you know, as, you know, software gets into more and more things, we're, we're going to need to have confidence that it hasn't been altered, that it came from the right place. Mm -hmm. And so keys are going to be even more used and finding the need to revoke one and, you know, invalidate one is going to be happening even more. And it's going to happen in moms and pop type operations, not just the big corporations that can run, you know, a PKI infrastructure. Yeah. Yeah, certainly. I I mean, I saw it with Secure Boot, where I'm like, well, someone has to uh, revoke that certificate and someone else has to update the revocation list. Someone else has to push out the revocation list, but then it's up to the user and or administrator to apply the revocation <laughs> list. And that's like a lot of steps in the process to make sure that you're preserving the software that, that boots your computer and then making sure it's trustworthy. Right. And half of those people probably don't understand their role. <laughs> At least the last part. Very true. Yeah. Very true. I was, uh, helping a user on a, a public Ubuntu forum who's going, I'm trying to apply um, an updated DBX revocation list and the software, which is LVFS or FWFD, is telling me that my bootloader is out of date and I can't. And they were really confused. I'm like, that's because the software is telling you if you apply the revocation list, the bootloader you have, the hash of that is in the revocation list and your system's not going to boot when you reboot. <laughs> they just... They, it, I mean, and that's, I, I had really smart people I work with to ask questions to understand it, right? And it's, it's not an easy thing to understand, so I don't fault them, right? I think when yeah, you most take people that, don't understand the detail architecture of a bootloader and yes, and all the, the details boot, and it, how all the angels and all the pins have to line up. Well, one thing I'm still amazed to this day is when I push the power button on my computer that I get all the way to a login prompt. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of stuff happening there. Yep. Sure. And it boots faster than they used to. Right. And more sec arguably more securely as well. Yep. Well, I mean, after they added Intel ME, but let's not get into that discussion. <laughs> well, that's a, that's a different, uh, entirely different supply chain, you know, uh, aspect, right, of what's inside your computer and what features are enabled and how do you know and how do you disable it, right? Yep. But, so, you well, know, software uh, supply chain, I think, is going to be, you know, something that a lot of people get surprised by. I think a lot of people are already working it, though, and uh, hopefully we can come up with, you know, things that are scalable and, and teachable and things you can require in contracts and agreements so that, you know, you actually have a reason to trust your systems going forward. One of the, it, so I've dubbed hold, this. Hold on, hold on, Paul. Sorry. If I can yeah, go interject. Ahead first. Uh, Jeff, go first. Robert uh, piqued my interest in something. I, I um, got caught you with something there. <laughs> well, what you just said, I'm, I'm curious. Uh, you know, we obviously talked to lots of vendors on this show and, and, you know, much of the cybersecurity community is vendor-based and everybody's putting out new products to do this, that, or the other. Um, and and most, most, but not all, of the companies that we talk to at, at trade shows and on the show, they're, they're focused on the enterprise and the large companies and basically the, the ones that can afford to buy whatever it is that they're, you know, whatever solution that they're coming up with. And, and there's many of us in the industry that are trying to do more for, you know, the, you know, the smaller companies, the ones that aren't as well funded that, you know, we, we, we try to figure out how to motivate them to do security, but acknowledge that they don't have generally the budgets that the larger enterprise type companies do. And, and what you just said just kind of piqued my interest is MITRE uh take in any of your activities that might or take a stance on um you know y yes you're you know you have these goals for organizations and institutions private and, and public sector but do, do you do you do anything different to try to address the fact that there's organizations out there 
uh, that may not be the you know the classic enterprise Fortune 100, 500 that are well. Oh, definitely. Um, you know, part so of could, the, could, could the tell the, us a little bit about that, please. Well, part of the community that we support is you know the critical infrastructures of the country. Yep. And yep. if you go look at those, you're going to find a lot of small organizations are, you know, running power grids, managing dams, doing all kinds of critical things. And so, you know, getting them secure, getting that capability reliable, predictably there is, is a big concern. And so the guidance that we try to help create and the things we try to motivate are not meant to only apply to the highly skilled and very complicatedly managed environments. It's it's meant mm -hmm. to work in um, the reality of the systems and capabilities that are out there. So, um, you know, that's a very broad statement, but that's definitely right. one of the North Stars of a lot of our efforts. Is well, to... part of the irony is, you know, you, you, you referred to smaller companies, but it's not necessarily smaller companies. I mean, you brought up. Uh, well, yeah, the, know, but their, their ability to manage soft, their ability to manage software, more... you know, cap based capabilities is small right. because they're mostly focused on other aspects of whatever business they're in. You know, right. the fact that they've have a cyber footprint is sometimes a surprise to them right exactly yep good well thank you i appreciate you uh yeah. enlightening no. us a little bit paul bob where on. do where do we stand on the what i'll call the solar winds problem right because i think this is with all third-party software the solar winds uh, case was a, a very interesting one is pretty widespread and enterprise grade software that was backdoored um it, we, how do we solve this problem? And I guess the second part of that is, where does the lines of responsibility fall in the supplier detecting that versus the consumer detecting that? And I hate to leave it to the consumer to go, well, you just got to detect yeah. the bad things that happen after the software is backdoored. I think we can do better. No. Yeah, no, I think in that IETF working group that I mentioned is really uh, a key part of making that uh, it possible to um, get the assurance about your developer mm -hmm. or the, the, the ones providing capability to you, have they done the right things to either secure their environment, um, run builds in a secure way, have the right training, do the right testing, regression testing, whatever the list of things are that would give you confidence that those different kinds of attacks aren't going to happen or didn't happen, that's the kind of data that you would have them put in skit ledgers that you then could either have a, you know, a third party come in and review them and say, yep, they're following best practice, just like they claim. And I've seen the evidence to support it. And then that third party could make an endorsement on uh, either a public ledger or somewhere that validates what's in the real private area and you know there's data behind it mm -hmm. so that's the general paradigm is that you know to understand whether a company an organization has done the right things is going to involve a lot of privileged private data so how do you capture that keep it you know so it can't be altered but it's not available to everyone, mm -hmm. but you can come back in and have people review it. Or if there's an incident like a solar winds, you can actually, you know, an investigator could get a subpoena and go follow the tracks and, and recover what happened and why did it happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I think there's a big difference between the appropriate processes were not in place versus a cyber criminal dropped off a bag of money in front of the developer's door and said, put a back door on the system. Right. I mean, that's uh, how do you defend against a, a cyber criminal that's bribing someone? That's that's hard. Yep, it yeah. is hard. 
More questions for Bob? Well, I, I, I actually, I'm kind of curious. I mean, now we're seeing supply chain security go big. I mean, it's 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 now monstrous. You know, uh, uh, I mean, Paul can't stop talking about it. Uh, I I think this is a good time, Paul, if you want to talk about uh, uh, what Sam asked you to mention. Um, oh, yeah. So we're focusing on the supply chain security for the months of January and February. I forgot to say that. Uh, at the top of the show, but we've actually booked and designed like these whole two months to focus on this topic. Bob, you were our first interview. And I appreciate that. (laughs) Yeah. And thanks for for coming on the show. It's been, again, as Josh said, we love talking about this topic uh, and I thought it was timely and there's a lot to unpack. So, uh, and Bob, you've done just a tremendous job in in helping us think about this problem in a different way and telling us about things that um, are are in the works to address these issues that that are going to continue you know, from now to the end of time, really, we have, we're going to have software supply chain issues. Uh, I think we need to be better poised to deal with them. And so, yeah, so that no, we actually, definitely have to do things are better. Mm-hmm. Well, that's the question. So Bob, it's the first show of the year and we're talking supply chain security. What's your predictions for supply chain security? <laughs> no, no. <laughs> I thought we now decided we weren't going to do slide. predictions. Josh. Luckily I'm all alone. Don't worry, we'll get your <laughs> wife to slap you later. And we know why. That's no, difficult. I think there's going to, you know, start to be some progress in a couple of these areas. I mean, by default in the U.S. federal government, the executive order um, that was put together that addresses some of this area, you know, put in the requirement for S bombs, put in the requirement for attestations about how you develop the software. That's Executive Order uh, 14028. The only reason I remember it is 14, then you double it, it's 28. Now that's um, how I'm going to remember it. <clears throat> yep. Well, but the thing is that that actually gets invoked and has to be met this spring. And so a lot of people who are providing software to the federal government are going to really start, you know, trying to uh, deliver in a repeatable way some of the things that we've been talking about. And the thing about it is they may be the one, you know, handing the software to the government, but they've got a supply chain. And in order for them to make an attestation about what they deliver, they need evidence from everyone up their supply chain. And so you're going to start seeing things changing i think so your prediction is things are going to change i love it that's awesome <laughs> brilliant let's I'm check sorry. back next january and see how it, <laughs> see how things changed or not bob we just have five I, I just, five questions yes we just have five questions left for you ready to play five questions with security weekly Bob's like, I don't know. I'm sorry. I missed that. Oh, I said, are you ready to play five questions with security? Oh, sure. (laughs) There's no good right. Five silly questions. No right or wrong answer. Three words to describe yourself. Uh, Scuba diver extraordinaire. Serial killer. What would be your weapon of choice? A knife. If you were to book about yourself, what would the title be? Um... Underwater Adventures. What is your favorite hacker movie? Oh. I'm sorry, I'm drawing a blank. I'm, um, the one, uh, do you want to play a game? That's War, War games. games. War Games. Very good. Yeah. Good choice. Choose two celebrities to be your parents. Alive, dead, fictional, or otherwise. <laughs> uh... <clears throat> I don't know. Um, this is totally bizarre, but Lucille Ball and Captain Kangaroo. Whoa. There you go. <laughs> That's awesome. Ooh. That's awesome. Thank you. Bob, thank you so wow. much for appearing on Paul's Security Weekly. It was wonderful having you. Yeah, okay. It was great up until the last couple of questions. <laughs> yeah, you did great. <laughs> ah, you did great. No right or wrong answer. With that, we'll take a short break. Come back. Stay tuned for the security news. 